My name's Alan Robertson. I'm president of the Australian Academy of Law, and I welcome all of you to this uh, class actions forum, which promises to be a most stimulating event. It's a joint Australian Academy of Law and Law Council of Australia event, and it's the result of detailed and harmonious co cooperation between the two bodies. And I thank the Law Council of Australia, and in particular, Jessica Morrow, the uh, section administrator. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which this event takes place, the Gadigal people for those of us in Sydney and the Ngunnawal people for those of us in Canberra. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. First, for those of you who are not familiar with it, a brief word about the Australian Academy of Law. It was established in 2007. It is independent, it's a national body. It comprises about 400 elected individuals of exceptional distinction in the discipline of law who are committed to the advancement of that discipline and to justice according to law. Fellows are elected by the academy from the legal profession, from legal academia, and from the judiciary and the academy uh, provides a bridge between each of those sections of the legal community and its objects are pursued through uh, forums such as this evening through public conferences and debates prizes and scholarships in publications uh, and newsletters and through the individual activities of the fellows next a brief word about the law council of australia the peak national representative body of the Australian legal profession. It represents the Australian legal profession on national and international issues, on federal law and the operation of federal courts and tribunals, works for the improvement of the law and of the administration of justice. And it's a federal organization representing some 65,000 Australian lawyers through their bar associations and law societies and law firms Australia, the constituent bodies of the LCA. Can I mention briefly four forthcoming events of the Academy of Law? Uh, there's the uh, uh, 8th of September uh, to celebrate or to mark anyway, 40 years of part 4A, the general anti-avoidance provision of the uh, Income Tax Assessment Act. Uh, and uh, former Chief Justice Murray Gleeson uh, AC will be one of the panelists. So that's on the 8th of September. They'll all be accessible remotely, these events. Uh, second, the 7th of October, the annual joint seminar uh, between the Academy of Law and the Australian Academy of Science. And two eminent scientists and two eminent lawyers will give their perspectives on artificial intelligence. Third, the annual uh, patrons address on the 21st of October, uh, uh, where uh, Chief Justice Alsop has very kindly agreed to give that address. Uh, as I said, 21 October 2021 will be based in Melbourne, but accessible remotely. And then fourth, on the 3rd of November 2021 in Brisbane, the uh, presidents or heads of jurisdiction of the Intermediate Courts of Appeal in Australia will discuss with each other common issues arising from the operation of Intermediate Courts of Appeal. And that should be a unique and interesting occasion. The chair for tonight's event, for tonight's forum, is John Sheehan QC, who really needs no introduction from me. He's done a vast amount of work uh, organising this evening's forum, and I thank him for that. Uh, he practices widely in all aspects of complex commercial disputes, trials, appeals, uh, domestic and international commercial arbitrations, and relevantly to this evening, representative proceedings, or as we know them, class actions. He's a current member of the, of the Australian Takeovers panel, uh, being reappointed to the panel in April this year for a third term, having previously been appointed uh, in 2014. Uh, John Sheen is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Law, a founding member of Maxwell 42 Chambers in Singapore, and an associate member of South Square Chambers, Gray's Inn in London. So I'll now hand over to John, who will introduce the speakers for this evening, Justin Gleeson SC, Susanna Taylor, Rebecca Gilson and 
and Jason Bates. Thank you, John. Thank you, Alan. Um, the, the past two and a half years have seen what can only be described as a whirlwind of activity in the class action space. That period began with the uh, tabling of the Australian Law Reforms Law Reform Commission's report number 134, uh, Integrity, Fairness and Efficiency, on the 21st of January. It was followed later that year by the unprecedented joint sitting of the New South Wales Court of Appeal and the full court of the Federal Court of Australia in cases dealing with whether the court had power to make a common fund order prior to settlement or judgment. Then, at the end of that year, the High Court overturned both those decisions, despite the unanimity of the two courts below. Not to be discouraged, the Federal Court of Australia two weeks later issued a revised practice note, the subtext of which was, don't worry, we will make common fund orders at settlement. Then in April, a couple of months later, the New South Wales Court of Appeal, a five judge bench, held that there was no power to make what are called early soft closure orders, which had previously been thought to be uh, an important device to facilitate settlement. Uh, and in doing so, they decided to not follow a decision of the full court of the federal court that everyone had been acting on for the previous three years. Then, uh, in May this year, uh, a single judge of the federal court, uh, Justice Beach, said that he thought that uh, the decision of the New South Wales Court of Appeal was easily distinguished. Uh, uh, Pre-settlement class closure orders could be made as long as they were worded correctly, uh, he, and he upheld the validity of class closure orders that had been made in that case, and offered as well some criticism of the reasoning of the New South Wales Court of Appeal. That same month, May last year, uh, the Federal Treasurer announced reforms to the litigation funding regime as it's governed by the Corporations Act. Those reforms bore no relationship to anything that had been recommended by the Australian Law Reform Commission, and they were announced and came into effect before the report of the Joint Parliamentary Committee that was then sitting and considering the same subjects. Their report was released on the 7th of December. In the meantime, the Victorian Parliament introduced Section 33 ZDA to the Supreme Court Act, uh, providing for group costs orders, in summary, orders uh, permitting contingency fees for law firms in class actions. Uh, during the course of 2020, uh, federal court judges took diametrically opposed views as to whether common fund orders could be made at settlement, despite the decision of the High Court uh, on pre-settlement common fund orders. And then in March this year, the High Court in Wigman's endorsed the beauty parade approach to resolving the problem of multiple class actions by a narrow majority. Then last week, uh, ASIC uh, announced it was minded not to renew, to renew administrative relief that it had given some time ago. And, uh, and if it follows through on that indication, it may affect the ability of law firms to conduct class actions on a no win, no fee basis. What, what is all this activity about? Um, one, one possible conclusion is that um, the decisions of the courts are evidencing different philosophies about class actions, and in particular, different approaches to the flexibility of the rules that govern them. Of course, the High Court always has the uh, casting vote on those questions, but the high composition of the High Court does not remain constant. But on the other side, uh, regulators and the government, something else is happening. Ostensibly, uh, it's a process, it's a regulatory reform process designed to protect the interests of group members in class actions. In particular, uh, to protect them from uh, what are from litigation funders, who are the people who, for the most part, provide the capital that's necessary actually to run class actions. But of course, if you regulate something, you tend to reduce the supply of it. And personally, I find all this rather confusing. And um, to give us a path through this thicket, we have um, 
a panel of exceptionally qualified guards. Um, Jason Betts um, is the co-author of one of the leading books on class actions in the country, class actions in Australia. Uh, he's a partner of Herbert Smith Freehills um, and he is, uh, I can uh, fairly say, uh, universally regarded as one of Australia's leading class action corporate regulatory and product liability specialists. He's got over 20 years litigation experience. He has defended some, possibly most of the largest uh, class actions in Australian legal history. Um, then uh, we have uh, Rebecca Gilsonen, uh, who uh, is frequently on the other side to Jason, but I think they still get on. Uh, she is um, a, a partner, uh, well, I should say a director of Morris Blackburn, she's on its board. Uh, and she is one of Australia's leading plaintiff class action lawyers um, with extensive experience in the conduct of complex uh, class actions, including in the area of price fixing, securities, uh, failed investment schemes, product liability, and um, mass torts. And in that respect, it's pertinent to mention uh, a signal victory in the Queensland floods class action after an enormous fight in the Supreme Court of New South Wales. She's also run a number of public interest actions in relation to gene patents and refugee rights. And she is a, uh, as well as being on the board of Morris Blackburn, the chair of the Public Interest Advocacy Committee and the chair of the University of New South Wales Law Schools Law Advisory Council. Uh, Susanna Taylor um, started her legal career uh, in London for the firm Hammonds Sattard's Edge and then came to Sydney where she was a litigation specialist at Norton Rose Fulbright for a dozen years. Uh, she saw the light and went to work in 2014 uh, for LCM and she is a, a litigation funding firm uh, that is listed now on the London Stock Exchange and she is its head of investments for the Australia Pacific region, which includes uh, Australia and at least Singapore. Um, finally, we have Justin Gleeson, SC. Um, Justin uh, has a, had over 30 years legal experience uh, as a solicitor, as junior counsel commencing in 1989, as senior counsel from 2000, uh, he was Australia's 10th Solicitor General from 2012 to 2016. And for those of you who haven't uh, heard me say this before, David, David Bennett, one of his predecessors, was famous for saying that being Solicitor General for the Commonwealth was the best legal job in the country, bar none. Uh, Justin is uh, a fellow of the Australian Academy of Law, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration and prolific author. Since um, I have the chambers next door to Justin these days, I can afford to be a little bit indiscreet and tell you two other, three other things about him. Well, one's not indiscreet, it's that um, uh, relevantly for this seminar, he appeared in both the recent High Court decisions that I mentioned in my little chronology earlier. Uh, the others are that um, uh, Justin has a truly encyclopedic knowledge of the law and he has a, a penetrating intelligence that is the envy of all his colleagues. So between those four presenters, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, there will be uh, some guidance for us all, I hope, through the issues that I've touched on ever so briefly in that introduction. Uh, we're going to start, um, we're going to conduct the session by dividing it up into some subtopics, which will be addressed by one or more of our panelists. In the first, in the first Jason Betts is going to um, give us a bit of a rundown on where we are, uh, what kind of class actions are running, what are the current issues that are arising in them. Um, and what sorts of regulatory reforms and issues are in play. Uh, can I turn over then to Jason Betts? Thanks, John. So your, your summary is a really excellent with respect um, landscape of the increasing 
sophistication and development in the Australian class action, I'll call it an ecosystem over the last two years and a little more. And it is difficult, I think, to conceive of a period where there's been more, at least in the class action space, judicial pronouncement and regulatory or, or governmental review. There's almost review fatigue at the moment within the class action community at the number of times the system's being considered and reforms debated. And we've also seen, unusually, a period of actual legislative change and an augmented level, I think, of proposed reforms. The, the why for that is complicated. At least some of it's a function, I think, of the, I'll use the word meaningful growth in class action litigation in recent years, because I don't want to press into a debate upon whether it's excessive or not just yet, although I'm sure we'll get to that. But that has consequences, doctrinal, procedural, political, a range of um, pressure points exposed by that meaningful growth. And it's easy to talk about growth and perhaps it's useful to expose that quant in a quantitative and a qualitative way. There was some analytical research published by Professor Morabito um, in May of this year and he, he painted an illuminating, as he always does, an illuminating picture of the developing landscapes. When one looks at the last four years of class action practice in Australia, we are seeing something approaching 60 class actions filed in the country across the various jurisdictions in which that can be done per annum. That's a little higher in those last four years than the longer term, I'll call the close to 30 year trend which is a per annum rate of closer to 25. So we're seeing a, a possible uptake in the frequency of class action litigation per se. So we're looking at a class action filed every week and uh, a number of those um, on average, and a number of those are, are claims that are overlapping or what we practitioners, and I'm sure many in this sophisticated audience call competing class actions. And we'll talk about that more uh, as part of the panel discussion. The, the last 12 months has coincidentally seen the highest rate of filings per year. So in the last 12 months to March 2021, where there were 69 class actions filed. And that's the biggest uh, number since the commencement of Part 4A. Interestingly, uh, and perhaps some trivia, 11 of those actions were filed in the, in the 48 hours prior to the introduction of the new funding reforms uh, that, that, that removes some of the traditional protections from a managed investment scheme and AFSL perspective that applied to litigation funders supporting class actions, no doubt to, to gain, I don't say this pejoratively, to gain the benefit of the pre-existing regulatory environment uh, and avoid, um, avoid the new regulations. Um, we have also seen an interesting cross-section of things happening within the jurisdictions. So take the state jurisdictions uh, for example over the last four years the filings in the New South Wales Supreme Court as compared to the Victorian Supreme Court are broadly the same 43 claims filed in New South Wales 40 in Victoria but Victoria's made a, a, a stunning comeback in those statistics over the last um, uh, 12 months or so we've seen in that period uh, a 22 to 5 victory for the Victorian Supreme Court in terms of frequency or, 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 or incidence of filing. And that could be a product of several factors, including, but not only, the fact that group cost orders, as we'll discuss later, contingency fees effectively are now available in the Victorian jurisdiction. But notwithstanding that, for now at least, the, the federal court remains the jurisdiction of choice with close to 150 cases, class action cases filed in that jurisdiction over that four year window. So it's procedurally complex. The motivations for these trends are difficult to diagnose and probably aren't capable of one diagnosis. And there's also this nuance associated with what's, what regimes are available in, in, in different jurisdictions and the economics behind claims in those jurisdictions. In terms of the anatomy of the claims and the typology of the claims that are being filed, um, there has also been some increasing diversification in the kinds of claims that we're seeing filed in Australia. So um, broadly speaking, that recent research suggests that what I'll loosely call consumer claims are on the rise. Um, and proportionately, 
at the expense of shareholder class action litigation. So over that same period, we've seen um, in, in FY 2019, we've seen something like 30% of all class actions being in the shareholder litigation space. Financial products have also occupied a fair bit of re, 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 real estate. 15% of all claims were in that space. 30% were consumer claims. And through various trends in the litigation, we've seen an uptake in claims against government, the government or government agencies and claims based on employment law allegations have also risen to about 10% of all claims filed over that year. You can't really diagnose what's happening in the market without also identifying the story and development of the Australian litigation funding market. So over the almost 30 years of class actions in Australia, at least statutory class actions since the creation of Part 4A, a little over a third of all class actions have been supported by a third party funder. And the third party funder funding market in Australia is, I think, easily the most sophisticated and developed in the world. Uh, the absence of contingency fees traditionally has been a significant reason for that serious growth. Um, in the last four years, the number of or the proportion of funded class action proceedings has approached 60%. Funding is um, an increasingly significant feature of the Australian class action environment. And over the last four years, the number of funded cases has essentially doubled. We have seen that decline. I don't know if this is an anomaly or not, but we have seen that decline, that proportionality decline somewhat over the last year, possibly a combination of various factors, maybe some destabilisation, uh, Susanna will address this, I'm sure, some destabilisation in the what I'll call the broader funding market due to uncertainty about the regulatory changes that might be introduced in Australia or, or the transaction costs associated with adjusting to those changes. We've also seen um, uh, the no win, no fee, um, speculative uh, funding of class action litigation by law firms, possibly a byproduct of the fact that in multiplicity con contests, which we'll come to, a conventional view is that a no win, no fee model may have advantages in terms of a carriage motion over um, claims funded by third party interests. Um, and that, that's probably been incentivized to some degree as well by the introduction of contingency fees in Victoria. Again, even that statistic isn't capable of easy analysis. It's multifactorial to use a phrase that we use a lot at the moment as to what's driving um, the changes to the funding market. And, and there really isn't a more sophisticated market than that in Australia. Um, another big flavour of these developments, which it would be remiss of me not to mention, is that, that controversy uh, and debate has been triggered by the costs associated with the prosecution of class action claims, the theme will come to shortly, and the recovery of those in those claims compared to those costs to group members. Um, as a I'm a defendant's lawyer largely, so it's hardly for me to um, diagnose those issues in any great detail, but some, some, some analysis has been introduced into the market uh, last year, including by Professor Cashman and, and Michael Legg, who, who looked at class action settlements over about a 10 year period, I'm sorry, a 20 year period up to 2020. And they these statistics need to be addressed as sort of indicative, don't, don't, don't take them as completely forensic or analytical, but the legal costs incurred by law firms prosecuting class actions, and these cases are, are significant and they are costly to run, um, generally were responsible for something like 15% of the total settlement value generated by cases settling over that period, as opposed to litigation funders, who, again, very broad statistic, each case is different, extracted something close to 25, 26% of the value of settlements over those period, over that period. And so we're looking at, and I don't say this pejoratively, an extraction of about 40% of the value of settlements in class actions over that 20 year period to, to those that prosecute and promote them. That's relevant, not, not because it is good or bad, um, but because it's generated significant debate 
um, emblem, emblematic in the work of the Australian Law Reform Commission and of course the Parliamentary Committee about in Australia, we're 30 years into this experiment, is the balance right between cost and recovery and is the class action mechanism achieving its goals? All of that statistical landscape I've entered hasn't mentioned anything about some of the fundamental doctrinal and jurisprudential changes over that period. We've had, it's not for today's discussion, but we've had temporary changes to our substantive law about continuous disclosure, which, which is relevant tangentially because that's the launching pad for 20% of 30% of all class actions in this country. And now we're having a debate in parliament about whether those temporary changes should be made permanent. It's con that's very controversial as, as anyone who reads the casually reads the media in this space can tell. We've seen the federal government change the law in respect of litigation funders, as John mentioned, and as other panelists will pick up uh, to, to remove some of those traditional exemptions around managed investment scheme provisions of the Corporations Act and the need for an AFSL. We've seen an enormous parliament and, and controversial parliamentary joint committee examine class actions and, and litigation funding uh, with over 100 submissions received, uh, four, four days of public hearings and uh, a commit, c conducted over two weeks, uh, largely focused on the, on the costs and, and merit of our class action environment in Australia and whether reforms are, are necessary. Not to mention, I think as John also said, the, the extinction potentially of the common fund order, at least at the early stages of proceedings, a question mark as to their availability at the settlement uh, stage of a proceeding, the almost certain extinction of interlocutory class closure, a dark horse issue in my view, certainly in jurisdictions other than Victoria because of its criticality to uh, how parties settle these claims. We've seen contingency fees in Victoria, um, uh, again, generating significant debate, hotly debated, and major decisions uh, in the New South Wales Supreme Court, the full federal court, and ultimately the high court on questions about common fund orders, apprehended bias for judges sitting on particular matters, class closure, as I mentioned, the concurrent hearing of class actions with regulatory proceedings, common questions and how they're deployed, and most significantly, I think, multiplicity culminating in, in the High Court, and we'll return to that. I say all of that to say that these um, topics and, and this di diversification of opinion about whether class actions are working correctly um, gives rise to really two broad banner questions that I'm sure we'll expose in the exchanges today. Um, the first is, are the current settings, regulatory settings for funding and for law firms, plaintiff and defendant, and uh, for group member returns and funders returns, are those settings um, modulated in the right way such that the policy behind class action litigation in part 48 cells being achieved? And secondly, have we got the balance between recoveries and costs um, correct? And is the system being used to generally recover um, compensation on behalf of aggrieved claimants? Uh, or is it more a launching pad for this significant generation of profit from our legal system? These are controversial topics debated as early as Fostiff and Campbell's Cash and Carry and before. So uh, for all of those on the panel who are about to take up the cudgels, yeah, there really hasn't, there couldn't be a more interesting time to be a practitioner in the space with more difficult issues that sometimes are insoluble to try and resolve. Thank you, John. Um, okay. Thank you, Jason, very much indeed. Forgive me, Susanna. So having the stage set for us um, in that fashion, uh, an interesting time, possibly too interesting. Um, can I, the, the best person to talk next on the subject of capital and mitigation funding is Susanna. Uh, she's going to give us, I think, a bit of a description of, uh, of the market, how the capital is raised and how the process is regulated. Um, can I hand over to you? Thanks, John. Um, so you may not know that litigation funding is in fact an Australian invention. Um, it was first started here in the late 90s as a tool for insolvency practitioners to enable them to bring claims on behalf of insolvent companies. 
Um, it developed up until the FOSTIF decision of the High Court in 2007, and, and following that decision, it really expanded to other types of claims. Um, litigation funding is now used in a wide range of claims, not only in class actions, but insolvency matters, international arbitration, commercial claims, and it is, it is a global business. Um, so the ALRC uh, in their report in 2018 said that there were 25 funders operating in the Australian market at that time. Um, I think that was probably, that's an accurate statement. I think what happened in terms of the funding market is in Australia is that we potted along with probably a few um, players up until the point of the MoneyMax decision in 2016. And what MoneyMax did was um, said that it was open for a funder to um, seek a common fund order um, at an early stage of the proceedings. And what that meant was that litigation funders didn't have to spend time and money on a, an expensive and uncertain book build process, which had been done up until that point in time. So a book build is where you get class members to join the class action and enter into a funding arrangement. So MoneyMax really changed the landscape because what it, what it meant was that a funder could start a class action without engaging in a book build. And at that point in time, we really saw competition in the litigation funding market heat up. It was after MoneyMax that um, a number of UK funders started um, funding cases in Australia and in particular class actions. Um, so there is really a variety of, of funders who are operating in the Australian market. Um, of the 25 that the ALRC identified, I would say that there are really about 10 litigation funders that participate consistently in the Australian um, class action system. Um, of those 10, about half of them are Australian um, companies and um, LCM and Omni Bridgeway are, are two listed Australian um, entities, although LCM is listed on the London Stock Exchange now. Um, about half of the, the other half of the 10 who operate consistently are either UK or US funders. Um, there are a variety of structures used by litigation funders. There are publicly listed funders um, and funders such as LCM and Omni Bridgeway operate as funds managers. What I mean by that is that um, they manage a pool of capital which is contributed by institutional investors globally. Those institutional investors include pension funds, educational trusts, investment banks, um, and they contribute a large amount of capital to be managed by the litigation funder. And that capital is then able to be put to use in litigation globally, including in class actions in Australia. There are also private litigation funders about which there is less financial transparency and it's not possible to see where their capital comes from. And the ALRC in its report noted that there, there really is um, a large range of structures and that makes regulation of lit litigation funding quite difficult because there isn't a one size fits all model um, is difficult to apply. Um, in terms of the size of the market now, um, an IBIS World report in 2018, and I know that's not very up to date, but that's the most recent one there is, estimated that um, the Australian litigation funding market generated revenue of $142 million. So this is not a huge amount of money. Um, what we see um, occasionally are headlines about a funder in a particular case, uh, usually a class action, making a large return um, in one case. But what we have to remember is that funding is a business and it is the business of funding a series of claims. Litigation funders generally like to have diversified portfolios of investments um, that are not concentrated in one type of claim or one size of claim. So those investments will be in different geographies and, and different types. Um, litigation funding is of course non-recourse. Um, so if the, if the claim is unsuccessful, the funder is not paid. 
So you really have to look at litigation funding as a business and take with that the wins and the losses rather than focus on some outliers in terms of um, looking at the, the profits that are made by the funding business. Um, another aspect of, of capital uh, which is used in the class A actions um, landscape in Australia is the after the event insurance uh, market. Um, so what after the event insurance does is that it, it um, offers insurance to either a litigation funder or a plaintiff law firm um, from the adverse cost risk um, that they bear in terms of a class action. Um, there's not currently any statutory requirement for funders um, to give an adverse costs indemnity to class members um, and that has been recommended by the ALRC and also the PJC last year. Um, I think if that was to be implemented formally, it would be completely uncontroversial because as a matter of practice, generally um, funders do provide that indemnity and the plaintiff law firm who was acting in the best interests of um, the plaintiff class would ensure that the funder who they chose did provide that adverse cost indemnity. Um, obviously the exposure though for adverse costs can be really, really significant. And so to lay off some of that risk, um, funders and, and um, unfunded uh, class representatives can ensure against the downside risk of an adverse cost order um, by taking out a ATE insurance. That is generally sourced out of the London market. Um, and it does have another purpose in the class actions context. So, um, and that is in relation to security for costs. Um, again, there's no statutory requirement or presumption that a litigation funder will provide security for costs in a funded class action. But as a matter of practice, it is generally always conceded that if there is a funder, um, security will be paid, payable, um, and it will be provided um, by the funder. Um, in the recent Boral selection, um, case selection hearing, Justice Lee said that it is relatively uncommon um, now for security for costs in large class actions to be provided by way of cash. Um, the reason for that is that we really are talking about large amounts of money. And in one of the class actions that we are um, funding at the moment, um, a defendant has made an application for security for costs in an amount of $2.6 million up to the point in time where they will file a defence. So these are, these are really large numbers. Um, and so it really becomes uneconomic for um, a funder to, to put up cash um, and, and also for plaintiff law firms, I think, to put up cash. And so to deal with that issue, um, security for costs is often provided in the form of an indemnity, either from the funder directly or from the, um, uh, the provider of the ATE insurance in favour of the defendant. That is still an area of controversy. There are conflicting judgments on whether um, an indemnity is um, adequate security for costs. Um, just moving on to the current status of um, state of regulation of litigation funding. Um, both John and Jason have um, already mentioned the highlights, um, but I'll just go through a few a few additional points. Basically, up until about uh, up until very very recently, there was no specific regulation of litigation funders bespoke for them. Of course, litigation funding was regulated um, in terms of the supervisory role of the court, um, obligations under the Corporations Act and the Competition and Consumer Act, and for the funders who are listed, like LCM, um, the obligations by virtue of the market on which they were listed are listed. Um, but no specific um, regulation. And, and there really have been inquiries after inquiries, um, all navel gazing as to how to best regulate this industry um, with not a lot of um, agreement. Um, the ALRC, um, the inquiry of the ALRC, which concluded at the end of 2018, 
was a very comprehensive um, inquiry with significant consultation across the entire industry um, and a very comprehensive report. That report made six recommendations in relation to um, regulation of litigation funding, um, none of which have been implemented and none of which included licensing, as in, sorry, uh, the, it did not recommend an AFSL for litigation funders. Um, so none of, those in, none of those recommendations were implemented and instead what happened in 2020 um, was that the Commonwealth Government um, announced that there would be yet another inquiry, the parliamentary Joint Committee and that inquiry was held last year and kind of more significantly um, because uh, an actual regulatory change was made um, was the um, change to the corporation's regulations to require litigation funders to hold an Australian financial services license if they were involved in class actions and also to require funded class actions to be registered as managed investment schemes. So that was announced without consultation um, with the industry uh, by the Treasurer in March last year. And I just wanted to read you the announcement that the Treasurer made at that time. Um, he said, now more than ever, we want Australian businesses staying in business and focused on keeping people in jobs rather than fending off class actions funded by unregulated and unaccountable parties. So that was the status. Uh, that was the stated purpose of the change to the corporations regulations. It really was um, intended to reduce the number of class actions um, and to create a barrier to entry. It, 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 there was no there was no mention in that statement of it. Um, the regulatory change being about improving outcomes for class members. So the um, changes took place, uh, were implemented in August last year. Um, and the state of play as we are now is that there are six litigation funders who have the um, Australian Financial Services license to enable them to run funded class actions. Um, there has not been a managed investment scheme a class action yet commenced in the court. So we're now, um, nine months, 10 months post the change. And we haven't actually had a ha had one commence. There's been three that have been announced, um, but um, they haven't actually um, been commenced. Um, I think what I would say about that is that it took both funders and ASIC um, considerable time to work out how to make this form of regulation fit class actions. Um, it is a form of regulation that was designed to protect investors who contributed money to an investment that was held and managed by someone else. That is quite a different character to a class action where a class member doesn't make a financial contribution, um, but rather it is the funder that makes the financial contribution to um, the costs of a class action. Um, so, the, the other thing I would say about the change to the corporations regulations is that ASIC has um, issued three um, separate uh, relief instruments to try and make this form of regulation fit and, and last week issued a further consultation paper um, uh, foreshadowing some further relief and also the end to some of the relief that they've granted. So there is a considerable amount of uncertainty as to how to comply with this new form of regulation. Um, so I think that, um, I think it was Jason who posed the question, has this resulted in a reduction in the number of funded class actions? I think it definitely has. Um, and, and the reason for that is the uncertainty around this new regulatory regime. And also the fact that not all of the funders operating are choosing to, um, to get the license and to continue operating. So that does mean a reduction in competition um, and a reduction in competition has an effect on, on funding commission as well. Um, John, I might hand back to you. Thank you for that, Susanna. What, what you were saying reminded me of me hearing uh, Hugh McLennan uh, a decade or so ago say at a seminar that um, 
IMF welcomed additional regulation of litigation funding because it would be a barrier to entry for their competitors. And uh, here we are. Um, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, if we can turn from the subject of capital and, and litigation funding and its regulation to uh, fees and legal costs that, with a focus on the court. So here, here we have um, common fund orders, group costs orders, the role of law firms, and I think something to be said as well about that recent ASIC consultation paper. Um, we're going to hear from Justin and Rebecca on these topics, and I might ask you, Justin, to start. Well, thanks, John, and good evening, everyone. Pleased to be with you. Uh, I'm going to focus on the common fund order side of the issue, and I think Rebecca will deal with the group cost order question. Uh, I think everyone is reasonably clear on what we mean by a common fund order, uh, but just to recap, it's an order that in the event the representative proceedings are successful, but not otherwise, a share of the total proceeds to which the group members are entitled will be paid to the funder, apportioned across the members as consideration for the services which the funder has provided. Those services being meeting the legal costs, taking on the risk of adverse costs and so on. Uh, a useful starting point, I think, which is sometimes forgotten, is that uh, while there is long-standing precedent for orders in the nature of common fund orders <clears throat> in the United States, that was in a statutory context where the courts were given quite explicit powers in class actions to appoint class counsel and to approve attorneys' fees and what are described as non-taxable costs. And all of that could happen uh, at the early stage of the matter. What essentially happened in Australia in a brilliant but now partially doomed experiment by the federal court, uh, as we've been told from Money Max in 2016, was to eke out an early interlocutory common fund order using generally worded powers like section 33ZF of the Federal Court Act to achieve the result which in the United States had explicit statutory support. Uh, we know from the 5-2 majority decision in, in Brewster uh, that there is now no power for the court to make an early interlocutory CFO out of these generally worded statutory provisions. If that were to occur, there would need to be a fundamental amendment to the statute. Just pausing on Brewster for the moment, there are a number of different themes in the majority judgments which probably explain why it's difficult to know whether that case will lead to the settlement or judgment CFO also being extinguished. One theme in the judgment is that the early CFO risks the court straying beyond its core function of doing justice between the parties across the record. And it leads the court into the function of shoring up the viability of the action on the claimant side. And the majority expressed the view that if this was what the court was to do, which they didn't like, putting it frankly, there would need to be far clearer statutory language by which the court was given the power and the criteria by which to exercise such a power. H however, as we know, there are obiter statements in Brewster that the fund equalization order, the FEO, appears to be okay. It appears not to suffer these fundamental defects. And to the extent that is so, the theme from Brewster seems to be that with an FEO, uh, a certain number of group members have contractually committed to pay commissions to the funder. So that's a contract, and we all know contracts are in general respected by the law. And under the FEO, the funder is not to receive in total anything more than the total amount of contracted commissions. And what the FEO then does is meet a demand of equity by 
sharing those contracted commissions across the funded and the unfunded members. So the result of an FEO, or one result at least, is that uh, people who have not entered any contract with the funder can be required to pay something. And that seems to be within the limits of these statutory powers. But the, the thesis is that the funder cannot receive in total more than it has uh, obtained by way of contracted commissions. Now, since Brewster, uh, there have been a number of developments and they were mentioned by John in the outset. Uh, the first is we have various views taken um, at first instance as to whether a CFO could be made at the stage of settlement where a different suite of statutory powers are engaged. The, the second is that we have the New South Wales Court of Appeal and the full federal court uh, declining to decide whether the CFO can be made on settlement or judgment until it has an actual settlement or judgment. And the, the consequence of that is that uh, uh, parties who wished at an early stage of the proceedings, for example, when dealing with opt-out, uh, to have a court decision on whether there could be a CFO at the end of the matter are denied that certainty. And the third is that in the decision of Wigman's, which in terms is about multiplicity, we in fact see something of a shift in the High Court. And a cynic might be forgiven for thinking that the minority in Brewster, Justices Gager and Edelman, have now formed the majority in Wigman's, this time with Justice Gordon, noting that only five judges sat in the later case. And when I say that, I really take up one of John's themes from the outset, that there is a question of judicial philosophy involved here. And one philosophy is that uh, broadly worded statutory powers can be used by the courts to fashion results which are in the best interest of the members as a whole, as well as, of course, protecting the interests of the defendant on the opposite side of the record. And that has led to, in Wigman's, the view being taken that the uh, broader view of the beauty parade is within power, including the court taking into account where relevant competing funding models. However, it's significant that in Wigman's, the now dissenting judges, Chief Justice Kiefel and Justice Keane, saw the same problems which they did with the CFO, that the court should simply not be getting into comparing and choosing between group actions on the ground of competing funding models. That's a matter which should be done out of court between the funder and the group members. So they're the uh, developments as to where we are. And I'd just like to finish my remarks with a very dangerous exercise, which is a prediction as to where we might end up in the High Court in two or three years time when the matter is uh, resolved. In the case of a settlement, which is the most likely situation, but not the only one, uh, the court will have the express power under, for example, section 33V of the Federal Court Act to make such orders as are just with respect to the distribution of the money paid under the settlement. Uh, it's likely that an FEO is within those words given the observations in Brewster. The narrowest view would be that there is something fundamentally different between a CFO and an FEO such that a CFO can never fall within the settlement power. And the question is whether that narrow limitation would be accepted. Looking forward, we should assume that by the time the High Court comes to consider the question, an ideal test case has been set up. And what I mean by that is that the representative has put before the court the types of evidence that uh, President Andrew Bell referred to in the second Brewster decision, evidence of the size of the settlement sum, the costs expended by the funder, the risks taken on by the funder, the length and complexity of the proceedings, 
how much the group members will receive after the proposed funder's fee, perhaps how an alternative FEO would play out, evidence of what fees are charged in the market and approved by the court, Given the observations by the majority in Wigmans, there would be a contradictor at first instance, challenging the proposed CFO, and perhaps most critically of all, the evidence should show that at the stage of opt-out, the members were given advance notice of the funders' intentions at the stage of settlement in seeking a CFO, and thus it might be said the members by not opting out, made an informed choice to remain in the proceedings and take the benefit of the funders' services, creating a claim in justice that they should bear a reasonable remuneration, not limited to the contracted commissions. Uh, my hazard is that despite the observations in Brewster, a majority of the High Court might be persuaded to find that the CFO was within the power to make orders that are just with respect to the distribution of monies under a settlement, assuming the case has been set up in that fashion. Uh, whether the CFO could be made on judgment is a longer and more technically difficult exercise because it's a different suite of powers. And it may well be, perhaps ironically, that a judgment, it will be necessary to bring back in the gap filling provisions of section 33ZF in order to support the CFO. So I think at that point, John, I should hand back to you. Thank you very much indeed, Justin. Uh, I'll, I'll, before I call on Rebecca, something I should have said at the outset was that uh, for the benefit of the audience, that uh, questions are possible um, there will be a button on your screen somewhere and you can write them there and if you do, someone will see them and they may get asked and if they're asked, they're bound to be answered. Rebecca, thank you. Thank you and good evening. Um, I want to say something about group costs orders or contingency fees and the provision of and how the provision of capital by law firms in class actions is regulated at the moment. As this audience would well know, law firms are heavily regulated organisations and the lawyers conducting class actions have um, stringent ethical duties and duties to the court. Law firms provide capital in class actions under conditional costs agreements, where on success they will be paid their costs, sometimes with an uplift. For action, more recently, for actions conducted in Victoria, they might be paid a percentage fee under a group costs order which would be which percentage would be determined by the court. The law firm might also be required to provide security for costs in some form, and this is occurring increasingly regularly. So law firms acting in class actions have been acting on a no win, no fee basis for many years. And I should say it's not just law firms, it's legal centres, um, bodies like legal aid and law firms that, that do this. Um, regulated by their existing duties and with an additional level of oversight by the court in class actions. Recently, group costs orders or contingency fees have become available in Victoria and the courts, the intention is that the courts will manage that on a case by case basis. The first two applications for group costs orders were heard in June by Justice Nichols in the Victorian Supreme Court and her decisions are currently reserved. While I'm talking about group costs orders, I just want to point out that the use of group costs orders is a way to achieve the type of minimum return to group members that's being mooted and will be discussed uh, by others a bit later in this session. And to facilitate, facilitate the conduct of less valuable, but nevertheless important class actions. I think that group costs orders should be more widely available beyond Victoria. And as it happens, the Productivity Commission, the Victorian Law Reform Commission and the, ALR, uh, the ALRC agree with that position, or I agree with their position. The availability of contingency fees would enhance competition and choice for consumers um, and, and that would ultimately be for their benefit. That said, I don't take the view that group costs orders should be the only way to conduct class actions and litigation funding plays an important role. So to the point of regulation, I say that the current regulatory regime 
in respect of the provision of capital uh, for class actions by lawyers is working. I think the courts are best placed to manage group costs orders and legal costs, including the provision of security for costs on a case by case basis. And unless and until there is actually an identifiable problem with the provision of capital by law firms, I don't think further regulation is required. I, I would want to add to that, that it ought not to be said that ill-suited regulation of litigation funding should lead to further ill-suited regulation of law firms in order to uh, low level the playing field as between law firms and litigation funders. I think if there's problematic regulation of litigation funders, that should be dealt with. Uh, on, its own, um, on its own merits. A further issue regarding regulation of law firms acting on a no win, no fee basis has arisen in the past week because ASIC, um, as John and Susanna have mentioned, has determined to engage in consultation on various aspects of the Managed Investment Scheme regulatory process for litigation funding. ASIC's paper is mostly about making it easier for funders to comply with the MIS provisions, which seems sensible but there is a rather extraordinary proposal advanced by ASIC far into its paper, which is to repeal the 2012 exemption that ensures that lawyers can conduct class actions on a conditional fee basis without being at risk of being accused of conducting an unlicensed managed investment scheme. If no win, no fee class actions were considered to be a managed investment scheme, it'd be necessary for law firms and other entities like legal aid and legal centres who conduct class actions um, to create the extensive architecture that's required to conduct a managed investment scheme, which would impose additional costs on group members and an additional heavy regulatory burden on those entities. This architecture would include obtaining and maintaining an, a financial services licence, developing a PDS for each case and appointing or becoming a responsible entity. Incidentally, it would also require reforms to the legal profession uniform laws in each jurisdiction to permit lawyers to conduct managed investment schemes. It's likely that only the largest plaintiff firms could in fact obtain AFSLs, and this would ultimately undermine competition between plaintiff law firms and between plaintiff law firms and litigation funders, all of which will serve to limit access to justice and disadvantage the consumers of class actions, legal and funding services. Considering that most socially the most socially advantageous class actions uh, concerning consumer credit issues, personal injuries and human rights abuses are usually conducted on a no win, no fee basis, this proposal to erect substantial barriers to entry would have a clear and deleterious effect on access to justice. Um, there's a further proposal by ASIC that, that would require law firms conducting no win, no fee actions to have a credit licence and to comply with the credit code and the NCCPA all of which would be very inapposite and burdensome. I ask rhetorically for what end and at what cost to consumers and access to justice. Thanks, John. That's all I have to say about law firms and group costs orders. Thank you very much indeed, Rebecca. Um, if we can move on to the topic of efficiency, the, the heartland of, of this is uh, multiplicity of actions. Um, and uh, to address uh, that topic, uh, Impossible where we are, impossible reforms. Um, uh, Jason, Rebecca, and Justin are going to say a few words, and I might ask Jason to start. Thank you, John. So, efficiency and, and in particular multiplicity, you're right, they're emblematic of much of the debate around class action litigation at the moment. And it's fair to say that class action litigation is very expensive to prosecute and defend and Part of that is because the list of things that haven't been done yet and are unknown is sometimes longer than this list of things that are predictable. So uh, more so than conventional litigation, th these types of proceedings are enormously expensive on both sides. Um, the multiplicity issue is a common, everyone's talking about multiplicity. It's common. It's a common catchphrase at the moment. And, but I think it's important to just step back for two minutes and examine what we mean. It is not a recent phenomenon. And I think I think it's important because it ties a couple of threads together from the learned panel's comments about the history of class actions. Multiplicity, it is, it is relatively uncontroversial that part 4A tolerates multiple claims being brought against the defendant in relation to the same subject matter. That is not controversial. It is a product of the use of the language some or all in part in, in 33C. You can bring a claim on behalf 
behalf of some or all of the people who are similarly situated. And we've had multiplicity for many years. So for example, when one thinks of multiplicity, it's often you sort of think of it in two buckets, concurrent proceedings where there is there are two classes, same subject matter, but no overlap in the definition of groups. For example, a closed class on behalf of people who've signed a relationship agreement with a funder or a law firm and an open class of people who have not. That's, that is multiplicity without duplication of group member definition. Not easy, not easy to address, adds to complexity, but that's one type. Another type is what we commonly call competing claims where the group member definitions do overlap. Now, we've had the first kind concurrent class actions for some time. Back in the early days of class actions, litigation funders developed a technique that was ratified by the federal court of, of a closed class where the group definition had a criteria that limited access to those who were agreed to in terms of the applicant's funder. And when those kinds of claims were being filed, closed classes, we saw briefly in the grand tapestry of things, a practice called remaindering, where another law firm and or funder would commence a class that captured the people not in the closed class. One closed, one opened, carving out or closed. That continued for some time until cl closed classes became controversial in and of themselves for another reason. They were seen as denying access to the legal system by those who perhaps needed it the most in the shareholder space, the non-institutional shareholders who weren't being targeted because their claims were less valuable. That led to the development of common fund orders, which I won't rehearse the history of, but um, that allowed funders to bring open classes without the same economic disadvantages of signing up and through a book build process relationships with all group members. And that led to competing class actions where there were two or more open classes with group definitions that did overlap. And so there is a very long history to this growing level of concern and inefficiency associated with competing class actions. And while we think about Get Swift and perhaps AMP as recent and perhaps emblematic examples of multiplicity, older cases like Centro and Oz Minerals, where you had that concurrent configuration uh, were also driving concerns in the system. Um, so, is this just a problem that lawyers are worried about or is it actually real? That is a hard question to answer. In an in a anecdotal sense, it, most of the work that I'm doing at the moment, defending class action litigation, often in the corporate malfeasance space, involves issues of multiplicity, more than one claim being filed and the court's challenge to resolve that, that competition. Uh, statistically, much harder. We've looked at a selection of claims over the 27 years leading up to 2019 that we've had part 4A and we identified about 420 legal controversies that themselves gave rise to something close to 640 class actions. That doesn't tell you the proportion of class actions that have multiplicity, but it does tell you this issue is not is real and not theoretical. What's the so, so it's happening in our market. And that's why it's generating debate even before the High Court, as, as Justin explained with his discussion of Wigman's and other matters. What is the law on this? Um, the law is, goes something like this. Um, as I said, uh, multiple proceedings do not offend the principles of Part 4A. In fact, they're um, completely consistent with the terms of the threshold requirements of 33C. Lock that in. Uh, the fact that a second or subsequent overlapping proceeding is commenced, in and of itself does not render that proceeding an abusive process. Um, that was a controversial topic for some time, including recently, the current state of the law articulated by the High Court and cases before it, like the full court in Get Swift, says no, it's not per se an abuse, can be in some circumstances, not per se. It, it's over to the court then to manage the competition in a way that reduces inefficiency and wasted time and cost. The starting point, although this is a little more controversial, the starting point of many courts will be that multiplicity is not to be encouraged and that the competing representative proceedings run by different firms of solicitors with different funders can be 
inimical, inimical to the act to the administration of justice. Uh, Justice, Chief Justice Alsop said that um, uh, in one of the incarnations of the AMP proceedings. The High Court, as I think John said in his opening remarks, has embraced a multifactorial carriage motion style um, process for the resolution of competing class actions, but they've been very clear to say that that's not the only way. And one size, to quote the now famous catchphrase, does not fit all. And so uh, the courts over the few years leading up to the High Court's decision, and, and even currently before our courts, are grappling with the methodology for resolution. Not, not just the question of how do I resolve a carriage motion, but um, what are the factors uh, by which I should assess the winning vehicle? And are there methods other than a carriage motion to resolve the claims? Broadly, the courts have identified, and I can be very brief, four ways, and this is a gross oversimplification, four ways to resolve multiplicity. One way is what I call the get swift approach, which is to line them up, evaluate which one is likely to achieve the best outcome for group members, pick that one and stay permanently the other proceedings. That's the carriage, that's a traditional style carriage motion pejoratively referred to as the beauty parade. That's one way. Another way, emblem, em, perhaps emblematic from a, the decision of Justice Beach and Bellamy's, is to allow one proceeding to continue as an open class and close uh, another proceeding and carve those closed group members out of the open proceeding. That may be appropriate, less so perhaps today, but may be appropriate where the one of the class action vehicles has entrenched relationships with a number of group members who would be disaffected if they were forced to join another proceeding. Creates efficiency concerns because still two matters proceed before the courts and the courts have to turn to how to manage those um, efficiently. A third way, uh, which is not uncommon, but perhaps is harder practically, is consolidation. Force the proceedings together. Controversial if there is a lack of cooperation or appetite amongst the promoters of the claims. And in one famous example in the New South Wales Supreme Court, consolidation occurred in circumstances where the court would only permit one law firm to prosecute the claim, claims of the group members in the consolidated vehicle. And that's also emblematic in the federal court in, the, in Justice Murphy's decision in Brambles where he effectively did something similar. And finally, perhaps the lightest approach to resolving multiplicity is to allow multiple proceedings to travel together, but to case manage them efficiently together and perhaps to hear them jointly at trial. That is the modality that perhaps has caused the most concern for the clients that I represent because um, without um, very efficient scrutiny being applied to the management of competing claims, they can be productive of interlocutor disputation, wasted time, wasted cost, or unreasonable or excessive costs is the concern that's often articulated. F finally, before I pass over to others in this space, that describes the problem. It doesn't tell us much about the solution um, beyond what the High Court's promulgated. It has been suggested by the ALRC in its 2018 report and by some uh, bodies and commentators since then, including I think a product of the Parliamentary Joint Committee's report, that we should front load the management of multiplicity. A problem at the moment is not just what's the criteria, but it is the fact that multiple proceedings can be commenced at different times. And a technique the architecture of which has not been fully developed yet is perhaps there's a moratorium period after the commencement of a claim within which any other competing claim should be identified and filed and then a carriage motion conducted it before the proceedings get into the thrust of their interlocutory process. So these issues are resolved up front. That doesn't deal with criteria, but it is, it is a potential solution to the multiplicity problem in terms of a process. I say that that's probably not going far enough. That doesn't address what happens when proceedings are commenced in, in other jurisdictions. That would invoke complicated questions of jurisdiction and cross-vesting. And it doesn't address questions like, how does the court evaluate um, whether there should be lead plaintiff provisions to identify the best candidate for an applicant? When should a common fund order be made? At the moment, it cannot be made at that stage. 
should there be class closure at an early stage to really make this process efficient? We'll come to that later. This is a legislative issue at the moment, more so than just a jurisprudential one. And, and it is creative of significant debate in our market. Thank you, Jason. Rebecca. I will quick, quickly say something about efficiency and the high transaction costs of class actions. First, I think it's important to reflect on how we actually think about this problem. True it is that class actions are usually more expensive than other forms of litigation, but they are also usually much cheaper and certainly more efficient than if the claims in a case or a portion of those claims were run individually. The legal system generally is very expensive and access to it in Australia very limited. Class actions almost always serve to facilitate access to justice for large numbers of people and businesses who would not otherwise gain access at all absent the class actions mechanism. So in class actions, the legal issues are usually complex and a lot of money at stake or important points of principle or both. With a lot at stake in an expensive system, a lot is spent prosecuting and defending these claims. The opportunity cost in the defendant taking a risky or novel approach in a class action is often relatively low. And if the consequences are that the claim or a substantial portion of the loss can be knocked out, it would be irrational often for a defendant not to take those points. There are many reforms that we could talk about that could be considered to make large scale litigation, whether class action litigation or otherwise cheaper. The key point that I want to make in relation to the high costs of running these actions is that any reforms must limit or control the costs of both sides of the action and not just the plaintiff side. The reforms that have been floated, such as capping the costs that can be, can be deducted from a class action settlement, must limit the costs of both sides in equal measure if they are to do anything more than place plaintiffs at a strategic disadvantage. The other point that I want to quickly make is that it's a mistake to muddle together the issues of the high transaction costs of class actions and guaranteeing a minimum return to group members. There is good reason to look at and seek to lessen the high transaction costs of running a class action, but to do so by seeking to enact a minimum return to group members is a blunt and problematic approach to that. I'll stop there because I think others are addressing the minimum return point. Thanks, Rebecca. Justin. Thanks, John. Were you inviting me to make a comment? I was, uh, if you had Thank anything you. to say on this subject. I, I had two comments. One was to embrace uh, what Rebecca has just said uh, in its entirety. And, and the point I wanted to add to that was we, we have to find a way in class actions in particular, but also in other very large multi-party commercial litigation to reduce the costs, not reduce them by a few dollars, but reduce them dramatically. One area that to me is a problem is the length of the hearing. At the moment, large multi-party class actions and like litigation, uh, and this is not a criticism of anyone, um, will be given a number of weeks or usually months, which the parties give to the court as their best estimate for how they will need to advance their case and uh, attack the case on the other side. In international commercial arbitration and in comparable domestic litigation overseas, parties are not given those lengthy periods for the hearing itself. Uh, as a crude overgeneralization, what might take two months in our courts would be allowed two weeks in an international commercial arbitration. Uh, I think the courts, uh, within the limits of procedural fairness, need to be far more robust and say, I've looked at the matter, that's the maximum time I'm giving you. Uh, my other comment in respect to um, uh, what Jason very helpfully described as the four options uh, at the moment, and then the possibility of statutory reform with a moratorium and a carriage motion. But beneath that, there is again, one of the fundamental philosophical questions John raised at the outset. The virtue of the US carriage motion, if you view it that way, is that the, because of the statutory provisions, the court takes control of the entire question at the outset. It, the court actively is encouraging competition between different funding models or law firms, and it produces the best solution it thinks on behalf of the group members at the outset, and then the matter goes forward. Uh, that is what the federal court was 
with respect trying to do here through both its approach to multiplicity and its approach to the common fund orders. Uh, really the choice is, do you go for the full scale American model, which will require comprehensive statutory reform, or do we uh, sort of muddle along with these variety of options? It's, it's, it's all very well to say um, one size does not fit all, but at the moment, the variety of options in fact conceals a range of different judicial approaches, which are not necessarily principled or at least all applying the same set of principles. Uh, Jason mentioned the example of the consolidation matter in the New South Wales uh, commercial list where the particular judge took a fairly, one might say interventionist view and sent the parties away, the funders away that is to essentially bargain over the action and produce the single result. Is that the correct approach or not? There are pretty important philosophical questions behind that. Thanks, John. Thank you, Justin. Um, now, the next little topic that we were going to address was settlement. Um, there's been a recent proposal that there should be a statutory minimum on the returns to group members. I think 70% has been proposed. Um, uh, and there's also a question of the court's power to intervene to appoint contradictors and there's the vexed topic of class closure and to address those um, we have uh, Susanna first and then I think Justin and Jason might have something to say. Thank you Susanna. Sure thanks. Um, so I just wanted to start on um, going over where this concept of a statutory minimum of 70% for class members actually came from. Um, so it was not the subject of any submission to the Parliamentary Joint um, Commission. Um, and it arose rather in the context of a disallowance motion, which was brought to disallow the amendments to the corporation's regulations requiring uh, class actions to be registered as managed investment schemes. So a disallowance motion was brought um, in the middle of last year and was delayed a number of times and there was a lot of um, political machinations in the background about um, how, the, how that disallowance motion would be voted on. In that context, Senator Pauline Hanson suggested that there could be an exemption for funded class actions from being registered as managed investment schemes if they were to guarantee 70% of um, class action outcomes to group members. So that's the origin of this um, idea of a uh, guaranteed minimum for class members. The PJC in their report then um, referred to it. And since that time, it has sort of um, gathered a, a life of its own. And um, in May this year, the new Attorney General announced that there would be consultation on this um, issue of whether there should be a, well, in fact, the consultation is not on whether there should be, um, it's how, can you please let us know how we can um, implement this statutory guarantee for class members, that, that is how the question was posed. Um, and the announcement by the Attorney General of this consultation process um, said, this measure is of particular importance to ensure successful applicants are adequately compensated in their cases, as well as preventing litigation fund funders and law firms from taking disproportionate fees in the process. So I just wanted to pick up on two of the phrases in that statement. The first is adequately compensated. Um, as we all know, the amount of compensation which is available to class members in a class action is a feature of many factors. Um, and those factors include the size of the claim, the merits of the claim, the amount that a defendant may be willing or able to pay in order to settle the claim. Um, compensation by its nature is often inadequate. Um, there, there, there is no form of litigation which comes with guarantees that compensation for plaintiffs of any form will be adequate. So it is a, a, a new concept that in class actions, the compensation that is achieved for class members must be adequate. 
Um, the second statement in uh, that the Attorney General, Attorney General made was um, that this proposal was to avoid disproportionate fees of funders and, and plaintiff law firms. That's an interesting statement in the context of the court supervisory role of class action settlements, because as we all know, plaintiff, uh, plaintiff law firms fees and funding commission are both subject to um, court approval in the context of the um, approval of a class action settlement. And that in itself is a rigorous process. Um, in terms of costs, the court will appoint an independent cost referee to give an opinion on whether the costs are um, reasonable. And in terms of funding commission, um, it's common for a contradicted to be appointed to uh, assist the court in determining whether the funding commission is reasonable. So the idea of a statutory minimum um, for class members um, is, suggests that this process that the court is undergoing at the moment is somehow inadequate. Um, and I really disagree that that's the case. And I, I agree with Rebecca that a statutory minimum um, is a blunt instrument um, and not one that really takes into account um, all of the nuances of class action settlement. Um, just taking um, as an example, a class action could at the outset, and this is often the case in litigation, um, look like it is worth a certain amount of money and look like it is likely to succeed. Um, but at a later stage of that class action proceeding, it may become apparent that that class action, the prospects of success have actually deteriorated considerably. It might be because of particular expert evidence. It may be because of the capacity of a defendant to pay a significant amount. In those circumstances, I think it's incumbent on the plaintiff's um, solicitors to seek to resolve the matter on the basis that the class members may get something rather than uh, proceed to a trial where they are likely to get nothing. So uh, the concept of a statutory guarantee for class members doesn't take into account these marginal cases where sometimes the best result for class members is to get out um, with a small settlement rather than losing everything at trial. Um, I'll just make a couple of other comments um, in relation to the effect that this could have on class actions going forward if the statutory minimum is implemented. There's a study um, that was done by PwC that found that historically 91% of class actions did not return 70% to group members. So that, that suggests that a large number of class actions will not be viable going forward. Um, and uh, the same PwC study said that 35% of those class actions, the costs themselves exceeded 30% of the settlement sum. So I think um, if those if these changes are implemented, what what the effect that they will have um, is firstly that it will only be the very very large class actions which will uh, be able to be brought um, as funded class actions, and as Rebecca indicated, that has a significant impact on access to justice, and also there is a problem with inequality of arms if the costs of the plaintiff side are limited and the costs of the defendant are not. Um, John, that's all I wanted to say on that topic. Thank you. Over to you, Justin. Uh, thanks, John. Just two observations. Uh, I agree with what's just been said by Susanna. Uh, assuming there isn't a minimum guaranteed statutory return, we, we really come back to where we currently are, that the court does have the power on the settlement to approve the settlement. And most probably, the court can, in exercising that power, take into account whether the contractual arrangements between the group and the funder, if it's a closed class, are fair and reasonable. And while this issue is not completely settled, the court uh, may be able to exercise its powers in a way that effectively intervenes in that contractual arrangement. Uh, my second observation was, um, uh, Susanna mentioned about a practice of a contradictor being appointed to deal with, for example, whether the remuneration is reasonable, and that seems to be sensible in at least some cases. Uh, I should say on contradictors that it was Justice Gordon in the High Court in Wigmans who very strongly put the proposition that 
in, in many aspects of the matter, including settlement, but there may be others, the court may need to appoint a contradictor or appoint a special referee in order to inquire into uh, these sorts of matters, which may affect group members and which the court may not want to, to directly delve into itself. At that point, while I wouldn't oppose a contradictor in the right case, I would like to echo um, something Rebecca said in a different context, which is that in, in every uh, representative action, there are responsible lawyers who are very mindful of their professional and ethical obliga obligations. And in my experience, acutely aware of the potential conflicts that can arise between the representative, the funder, the contracted group members, and the unfunded group members, if there are any. And they take steps to address those conflicts and they approach it often on the basis that they have the duties which one would have on an ex parte application to make sure the court is told everything on both sides of the record. So if there is an assumption creeping in from Wigman's that there needs to be a contradictor almost every time there is something which could be said on the other side of the record, I would oppose that assumption as not recognising the professional responsibilities upon the lawyers and the high standards which lawyers in this field practice on both sides of the record. Thank you, Justin, very encouraging. Uh, Jason. I'll be brief around class closure, but, but it's generated at least one question. I, I know it seems like a sort of a procedural nicety, the, the debate about the availability of class closure orders in the courts, but um, it's fundamental to whether or not class actions can be settled and including uh, whether they can be settled at an early stage. And, and just, just to very briefly paint the picture, a, a technique that parties and courts developed over many years to uh, create a parameter of certainty around who, who was ultimately participating in the claim and who was, who, what claims were being resolved in any settlement finally was class closure orders and they've come in various forms and permutations which are beyond today but the broad philosophy was if you're a group member register for to participate in a proceeding and if you do you can benefit from any settlement and if you're if you don't and the proceedings settle your claims extinguished that meant at the negotiating table the parties were completely informed as to the parameters of the debate around what they were resolving in respect of whom. Uh, two uh, Court of Appeal decisions in the New South Wales Supreme Court have, have indicated that uh, any class closure order at an interlocutory stage that has the effect of either excluding claims or creating a pathway for claims to be excluded as a result of non-participation or non-registration are beyond power. And so the current state of the law means that in, in, in negotiations and settlements presently passing through matters, um, the parties are sitting out at the negotiating table without the ability to say that the deal that they're striking is in respect of people who have come forward and registered for the claim and no one else. That is, the deal will have to accommodate further participation from additional group members who haven't yet registered. Now, there hasn't been... Or, the practice is still in the tall grass in terms of determining how this will all be resolved. But what it reverts to is a time when negotiations had to occur with a degree of contingency to accommodate groups of people who haven't yet come forward. As the Court of Appeal said in New South Wales, we settled class actions all the time for many years before class closure orders. So don't be too concerned. That is true, but class closure orders were developed because generally those settlement structures were suboptimal. For example, in the history, in the aristocrat settlement, the structure for that settlement pre-class closure orders were was an amount of money for registered group members, an amount of money who people for who for people who may come forward, with caps and collars. That is, the deal was off if a certain number of people came forward that exhausted the, the second pool of funds. That in fact happened. That first settlement deal therefore dissolved. That that was an inefficient and, and suboptimal process to bring that claim to resolution. All of those techniques are, are, are less attractive than a class closure mechanism. Victorian Supreme Court doesn't have this problem because there's a 
express statutory power requiring that, that, that can allow the court to require a group member to come forward to take a step to recover monies. But in the federal court and the Supreme Court in New South Wales, that problem persists. Several federal court judges have said uh, essentially in overdose, sometimes extrajudicially, that they doubt the wisdom of the Court of Appeals and now issue to the full court and ultimately maybe to a higher jurisdiction to test whether there can be some resolution of this position. More likely, statutory reform will be necessary. This is not a defendant-driven suggestion in the sense that certainty would benefit both camps. And we are both bedeviled by the fact that these claims take four years to resolve. And one aspect of making them on a more accelerated path may be to revisit class closure orders as a very valuable pre-settlement technique. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jason. Um, there are two models of regulation that are emerging and confirming power in the courts and letting the court, letting the market sort it out with the court as a guardian. And on the other hand, Parliament and ESSEC imposing a more uh, rigid form of regulation. Which way should we go? Susanna. I think that there is definitely a place for um, legislative regulation and some of the topics that we've um, touched on today, um, legislative um, reform could reduce some of the uncertainty. Um, for example, a statutory power to make a common fund order would be particularly useful. Um, and in addition, the regulation of litigation funders by way of a license um, is something that was long overdue um, and obviously something appropriate for um, statutory intervention. But when you get to issues around um, class action resolution and um, settlement, I think we have to remember that we have one of the most sophisticated class actions regimes in the world with the most sophisticated judiciary um, plaintiff bar and defendant bar. And um, they are um, the best players to actually um, deal with these complex and nuanced issues um, rather than using a blunt instrument of, of legislation. That's my Thank you, Thank you. Rebecca. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, this panel, in fact, has highlighted a number of areas that could benefit from legislative reform. And I note in that respect that there's a whole ALRC report that um, is sitting on the shelf with many sensible recommendations that are being ignored. So for me, I think it's quite clear that the current federal government, who seems to be the only one at the moment who's exercised by class action and, and funding concerns, is motivated by political ends in this sphere and um, has in particular has devised a number of uh, political solutions that I think are searching for empirical problems. So I guess where I land for the moment is that I think it should be left to the courts unless there's a focus, for example, on some of the issues that we've discussed and uh, the ALRC recommendations. Thank you. Jason. I am. Um... Around some procedural topics, I think that the time is, is overdue for some legislative reform. In particular, I think the adoption of a moratorium period within which competing claims have to be filed and resolved is important and it's supported by a number of bodies. I, I believe in early resolution of multiplicity through carriage motions, but it's difficult to identify real criteria and that, that 
it would be dangerous to legislate, but I think Justin makes a powerful point about the need for the courts to perhaps intervene with more aggression in that regard. And I do think my own view is that um, the time and cost associating with the resolution of class action proceedings, and I mean by way of settlement or trial, and we're seeing a trend back towards trial, in, in my opinion, it could be accelerated if we can address um, at, at, at least uh, the question of common fund orders at an early stage and the question of class closure at a very early stage. This would prepackage the proceeding in a form that's able to be either quickly resolved or an early decision made to take the matter to trial. There's a whole other topic here around the burden that discovery is placing on both parties in terms of time and cost, but that would also be part of a package of needed refreshed resolution because that's currently a, a, a problem in terms of the passage of these proceedings through the court system. Well, um, that, speaking for myself, that's given me a great deal of food for thought. I, I can only say that I hope that someone who has power to do something about it all is listening. Um, we, we do have some questions, but I'm afraid we are running out of time. So my thanks and apologies to those who went to the trouble of logging them into the system. Um, and my thank you to our panellists and to uh, those of you who have participated uh, on the other side of the screen. Thank you. Um, I think um, it might be my turn to say thank you. Is that the case, John? It is. Uh, uh, if anyone's still um, watching, uh, I'm Ben Slade, the co-chair with John Emmerich of the Law Council's Class Actions Committee, and it's been a joint project with the Australian Academy of Law, so we thank very much to Justice Alan Robinson. Um, Justice Kevin Lindgren, um, now retired, um, has been very active in uh, organising this event, and Susan Jenkins from the Australian Academy of Law. The Law Council of Australia, John Farrell and Jessica Morrow, who um, have done a lot of work to make this happen. Um, the federal court also, Jessica Dimitosian, um, thank you very much to her and also to Justice, the Chief Justice who um, uh, facilitated um, this uh, process that was going to be in the federal court, unfortunately, and we were going to be going to drinks now, but we can't do that. Um, John Sheehan, thank you very much for your efforts. And of course, to our panel, Jason Betts, Susanna Taylor, Rebecca Gilson and Justin Gleason, and thank you very much for having us. Signing off.